It's very hard to describe to somebody what you get from driving a racing car at the limit. It's about a set of emotions and a set of feelings. The feeling that you get driving the car, the feeling that you get competing, working with your team to maximize what you have, that's kind of all unbeatable. When I got to the end of the weekend, I wanted to know in my heart that I'd given 100%. And the feeling that comes with that is actually what is the drug, it's what's the motivator. I still want to go as fast as I've always done. I still want to put the car on the edge. I still want to bang doors with people or go wheel to wheel with them. I know I can't replace motor racing with anything else in my life. When that goes away, I'm not sure how else you could replace that. drive behind the film came from a desire to express how I feel about the sport, what I see in the sport, and to answer questions that I think really deserve to be answered. Reading about you a little bit, it's interesting to me uh, the motivation behind this film, uh, kind of talk a little bit about your background and why you felt like this would be a really good way to get yourself indoctrinated into a longer form of film. Yeah. So my, my background, um, as it relates to motorsport, I mean, I, I've been a fan ever since my dad took me to Lime Rock Park when I was a kid at, at summer camp up there. And I, I walked over the hill and there was this Porsche in the middle of a pit stop and, and, you know, fueler takes the fuel out of the car, fuel splashes, his, the tires are squealing, he's fishtailing, and he's on the rev limiter. And I was just like, oh my God, I need more of this in my life. So I've been hooked as a fan for since as long as I can remember. The sport has always given me such unique feelings, su such emotion, and, you know, just just sensations and the competition element of it as well. I've, I've been an athlete and competed, you know, from age five through college. So the competition really plays a part. I've always loved machinery and trucks. When I was a kid, I was I was into construction vehicles and earth movers and all that, just garbage trucks and anything with, you know, mechanical. So I think a lot of those things from an early age sort of have played into my uh, desire to be around motorsport as much as possible. And then the creativity element of it, um, sort of, I started making, you know, videos on, on little cameras on my phone and, and turned it into a profession, right? So... <laughs> So that's sort of the uh, the technical aspect of, of, you know, the more detail oriented stuff of like where my interest comes from and how I came to make this film. But in terms of the content itself and, and, and the story behind the film, I've never really, you know, when I've been into sports, I've never really cared about statistics. I've never cared about results necessarily. And just like this happened and this happened and this happened. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. that's why people compete, but I've always been more interested in what motivates people you know why do people mm. do what they do how does it feel to do this you know i want to i want to i always wanted to ask questions about elements of the sport that people never really asked or might not even think to ask or might not understand because you know being inside this car like you nobody can understand what it feels like and what it takes to pilot a car racing like this unless you've mm. been in one or done it yourself and not many people have I've been fortunate enough to be in some race cars a few times in the passenger seat when they have one going around a number of different racetracks across the country and in Canada, you know, with pro level drivers. And let me tell you that that opened my eyes to what it actually feels like to be in these cars. Was it your familiarity with with luxury cars and, and cars of this nature that really uh, you wanted to be this series? Because you could have gone and approached NASCAR, you could have approached Indy, you could have approached IROC. 
there's so many different categories for racing nowadays. Was that the motivating factor behind this, or was it just you met somebody who was compete? You, you met the guys from Rebel, and 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 it just happened. I, I'm kind of fascinated by that idea yeah, as well. 100. So IMSA itself has been around. Uh, I think they back in the day. I know they merged. They were like two different mm -hmm. series. I think it was Tudor and Grand M, and they merged the IMSA. So IMSA has mm -hmm. been around for a number of years. It's certainly not as well known as Formula One on the global scale, but they're they're like the biggest sports car racing uh, governing body in, in North America. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it probably came from, like I said, growing up, my dad always liked sports cars. Um, he's always been in the cars. I've always been in the cars. These are the races we grew up going to. And mm. I think I what I really like, I've never gotten much into NASCAR, IndyCar personally. Uh, Formula One, I do follow, but Formula One is is incredibly elite both from a sporting perspective and from a and an access perspective. Yeah, the access, the access <laughs> is near impossible. <laughs> but that being, that being said, you know, sports Ooh. cars worked for a number of reasons. Number one, I, I'm passionate about them. Number two, they relate to cars you see every day and can buy, which I've always thought is cool as opposed to IndyCar and Formula One, where it's just like nigh unattainable. And also, I had some relationships with drivers and teams in this series. So Robin Liddell, I had known for a number of years. I think back in 2016, we first met, we were introduced, and I had done oh, some cool. shorter films along with him and his previous team, Stevenson Motorsports, uh, when they raced in Audi. Right, looking low, looking low on the apron. Inside, inside, inside. Clear now, clear. Eight degrees away from driving on ice is where you're at at this point. And so, yeah, I mean, there, there was just this kind of perfect storm of all these different things coming together. Not only my personal passion for it, the, the right, um, you know, technical pieces fell into play, you know, and who I knew and, and when, and the fact that Frank was willing to do this and support the film because it was the first time I had met him through mm. Robin. Yeah, and, 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 and then other thing which is really important, which I think not many people necessarily think about, is that this film needed to be full access. I needed to have mm. complete access to the team, the good, the bad, the ugly. I needed to sit down with the drivers and do real deep dives for the voiceover, you know, hours in hotel rooms talking about, you know, not easy topics to talk about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when you talk about maybe NASCAR or IndyCar or Formula One or even teams in the IMSA series that are at the higher level, you, you just don't get that. Nobody really yeah. cares. Nobody's willing to. And also yeah. not everybody can give the insight that Robin and Frank gave. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's very uh, insider too. It's very, there, there's a look, there's a, there's a language behind it that they, they feel like no outsider would understand. They kind of speak their own language in that respect a little bit. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Sometimes. But the nice thing about yeah. this film is that, Normally, if you have two pro drivers like Robin and someone else, there there is a scene in there like at Lime Rock where him and Andrew Davis, who are who have driven together for a long time and they, this is their profession, they're talking. And yeah, a lot of that jargon, no one's <laughs> going to understand unless you're in, in the industry, right? Which yeah, is yeah. cool, and it's and it's a way of communicating how complicated it is to set up the car every race, you yeah. know, to get it ready to to compete. But also because we have Frank here, because Frank uh, comes from an amateur racing background and he's really learning what it's like to compete in the pros you also it really gives this level of accessibility to you to your person who may not understand motorsports and you learn a lot about it through frank and through his progression which is really mm -hmm. unique so it's it's kind of got this three-dimensional element to it it has the pro level competition but it also has the amateur getting into the pro leagues there was a lot of work went into this program we've been working on this really for arguably three years and, uh, you know, to finally get here with Frank, especially in his first season, he's had a very difficult start to the season. You know, that puts a lot of pressure on him, but he's a, he's a true sportsman and he's a team player. And he hasn't wavered his support and he's focused his mind on getting better. And I've worked very hard with him and he's worked very hard to get better. And I think you saw the results of those efforts and hats off to him because he's done a mega job. You know, I've never driven this track. So Rob and I came here in a rental car and drove around <laughs> to show me the track. <laughs> we, we went pretty slow. Anyway, but then I showed up here with a Camaro, and I've, I've never been on this track, and it's a pretty daunting track. So you spoke about the technicalities and how rigid technically these cars can be and how much the, the approach is to how careful down to the nth degree. I mean, one minor thing goes wrong, and 
people die, people get hurt, things happen. And so they're very, very careful and they're very cautious and regulations and all of those things. So to get the kind of access you got and to, to create mm -hmm. the movement that you created through body cams and, and GoPros and, and the things that you did to kind of get us into the cockpit of these cars, how much did you have to work with their engineering team and and kind of this is a unique thing for a filmmaker because a filmmaker would just set up a camera set up a shot figure it out and let it all play out in front of them but with your your approach you really had to depend upon the people who were commanding the environment and 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 figuring out to work within their technical specs and i'm kind of curious uh, if there was a lot of back and forth between you and the engineering team on that and how 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 easily or how difficult that might have been yeah yeah so, so for every race there were probably about four cameras in the car and i didn't want to use any of the broadcast cameras i just i wanted to have my own capture to give my you know use my yeah. settings use my angles use my everything i wanted to do plus a separate recordio for the audio because you can't rely on the gopro audio especially with the yeah. car that sounds, that sounds this good but joe joe yeah. hall who's the crew chief and has uh, a speaking role in the film as well he gives some of his insight it was my point of you know of contact he basically is responsible for everything with the car and he interfaces with all the other guys who work on the car as well as the engineering team and the drivers etc so uh you know i had had some uh again like my knowledge having rigged up cars in the past really helped here because yeah. it's it's not a, it's, it's you have to balance a lot of things you know where can you put it so it's not impeding the driver looking around where can you put it so it doesn't overheat and shut off in the middle of the race, especially with this car, the Camaro, a front engine car, it gets ridiculously hot in there. <laughs> Any metal will burn you if you touch mm -hmm. it for more than a second. So the GoPros tend to overheat pretty easily. So that was a challenge we had to overcome. Also, the batteries don't last that long. You had to record yeah. them well before the race and, 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 you know, want a little bit of leeway on the end. So I worked with Joe. We hooked up the, uh, the cameras to the main power supply of the car so they wouldn't run out. Um, and we had a few trial and error things with the cameras overheating during races. And we kind of found a system that worked. He was pretty easy to work with. He's a really nice guy, wanted to help. And the whole team was on board. So to be honest, it, it wasn't that difficult. Um, mm -hmm. the challenge I think came in me getting all that stuff ready and hitting record on everything and getting everything mm -hmm. framed correctly, getting the audio levels correct. And then also being where I needed to be with my personal rig, you know, my running mm -hmm. gun style rig that was doing wearing all those hats at the same time that was a big challenge and also obviously safety because you know you know knock on wood i've never had any issues with equipment i've placed in cars before but i am always very concerned and very aware of the fact that these guys are racing and if anything yeah. if, if an equipment if equipment falls off and is bouncing around the car or something distracts a driver and something happens as a result of that i mean you know god forbid i'd, ne I'd never want to be the reason uh any of that would happen so obviously these guys were here to race first and i was there to film second you know as mm -hmm. a, as absolutely a yeah hey, you know you mentioned it uh and we talked a little bit about the access and the idea of uh that these guys are a little bit closed off and a little bit you know in their own element and they want to stay in their own element and part of a challenge for a documentary filmmaker often is getting the subject's trust because ultimately over time you're telling their story and you're not you're not in a malicious way or intentive way of of telling anything that that possibly could go wrong and and all of the bad things that do happen but as a documentary filmmaker you can't get in the way of that either so how long did it take it take them to kind of get with you and figure out okay this guy's legit we're okay you yeah know, did, to feel comfortable with you. I'll go back to what I said earlier, because I think it is important to note the sports car racing as a whole is very down to earth compared to other series like, you know, maybe IndyCar, Formula One, stuff like that. You know, you walk around there as a fan, you can go up to the cars, you can kick the tires, you can talk to the drivers, you see them walking in and out of the same bathroom you do very often. So as a whole, it's really down to earth, which is really nice for a fan. And from a filmmaker's perspective, it gives you a lower barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, you know, most of the mechanics are just are just down to earth guys as well. Obviously, as with anything else, it's human nature. You know, someone new comes around and is putting the camera around. You're kind of a little like a little tense and a little like, what's this guy doing? But I, I'd say after a couple races, maybe two, three races, the guys sort of 
understood that I wasn't there to, you know, create reality TV and, and, and <laughs> cross off of anyone's drama or downfall, um, that I really was there to tell a unique story. And I told him, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not here to make any money look bad. I'm curious for somebody who really loves this sport and really wants to highlight this sport. What did the, this access and, and getting this film done do for you as a fan of this sport? Did you get something from it that you didn't expect that happened while you were filming and after, you know, putting it all together? Yes. And probably in two parts, part a, just, just, uh, as the season went, I, I was able to capture some in car and pit lane footage from mm -hmm. races with, with in incredible things that honestly, in my entire time as, as a fan, I haven't seen, I mean, the, the finish they had in, in the rain at, at you know, that, and even the 14 the, places in one lap, basically. Yeah, yeah. And the past 15 cars in like 15 minutes, I think it was. I mean, you know, 150 miles an hour flat out in the pouring rain, zero visibility. Yeah. Like, I was just like, to be able to have that immortalized in film is insane. And to see it from angles that you'll never see it on broadcast cameras, right? Left, right, right forwards and backwards, high quality audio, just, just the straight up race footage and the sound of the car. To me, that's priceless. And and something like that may never happen again. I mean, that finish was historic, literally, in every sense of the word. So that, number one, just to have captured some of the battles in car and that race and other races, crashes, battles, everything, that's really cool. And then number two, I think some of the, the insight garnered. So I feel like it's a little wasted opportunity. In the moment, you don't necessarily appreciate the opportunities that you've got in life. As you get to the end of your career and you start looking back, you realize in some regards how lucky you've been. Our opportunities to have those results again in the future are limited. I think that's where some of the emotion came from in the moment. You know, to have have been able to capture and really, honestly, you know, achieve what I wanted to achieve to actually be able to talk to Frank and Robin, especially about what truly drives them, how it truly feels. And I'm not just talking about like, oh, fast or hot or adrenaline. I mean, I mean, like what really is the reason they do this, why they keep doing it. And, and they didn't even know at the start of the interview process. Mm -hmm. They did not even know. Putting all this together, I have to imagine this was a daunting process. You probably had hundreds of hours of footage, millions of different angles and different ideas. And one of the things that I, I love talking about documentary filmmakers with is the idea of when you go into this thing, you have a preconceived notion of what you want to do. Then you get all the footage together, you get all the interviews done, and it kind of becomes its own little fire and has its own little breath. And... And it, and it seems like your initial thought, which was to figure out why they do what they do and why it drives them, seems to come through here. But was there a change in the way that this thing worked out for you that, that you didn't, didn't – when you started to put it together, saw, saw a different film that the narrative came together for? Yeah, well, well, I think that the story of the season kind of shaped the way the film was going to be because, like I said, it, regardless of how it worked out, I was going to have a film. Um, which is the nice part of, of the way I film and the questions I was posing. Yeah, I think that the vision the vision was always there, but the way my vision works, and I, you know, I can't say if this is the way filmmakers' visions works, but I, I kind of have little little blips and blurbs of things. I see you know some visuals and colors and sound, and I kind of like this would feel cool, and then maybe we do something like this. But yeah, always it's 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 never going to come out exactly how it is in your head, and I've had yeah. to learn to accept that as a filmmaker because at first when I started, I saw that I saw that as a failure, and I saw that as a problem. But then I realized that no matter what, even if you have all the time in the production studios in the world, it's never going to come out completely like it's in your head. Uh, some of those things are just due to limitations. Some of them are due to the fact that it just doesn't translate as you think it would, and some of them some things are actually also happy accidents. Sometimes you put a few clips next to each other in an editing room and mess around. And you're like, wow, that's actually really good. I never thought about that. There's a lot of intent, obviously, and a lot of purpose. Um, and there's also with documentary filmmaking, especially surrounding motorsport, we don't have, you know, multiple takes. 
There's a lot of like things you just yeah, have. that'd be tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that you didn't think you'd capture, or you happen to be in the right place at the right time, or you get an idea on the fly. More than anything else, I'd say throughout this whole process, I really trusted my gut. Not mm. only in the fact that I felt that I really needed to do this film, but also where to be and when around the track, and also what to do and when in the editing room. You know, this is a sport that is very disciplined, very thorough, and I, I'm wondering if any of that process, it starts from, you know, getting ready for the race to preparing and practicing for the race, to getting the car ready for the race, to then mapping it where the changes happen, because it, in this in this particular sport, drivers change and everything, you know, has to be precisioned. And I'm curious if any of that seeped into your filmmaking style, do you feel like that's something you would carry into the next films you make or do you feel like you kind of gain something from that perspective i think i mean not necessarily in a way i think that because they are a little bit different i mean the team is very precise with what why i they do and i'm you know i'm i could be a messy filmmaker i mean but I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think um i've also just learned to be precise over the course of of you know for because it works for me it makes things easier so I, I think I kind of am a little bit of both. I like to be very precise about, I, I double and triple check everything in terms of all my settings on the camera, double checking that everything's rolling when you're rolling, audio levels, GoPro stuff. I'll, I'll be meticulous with that. Uh, backing data up, I have it double or even triple backed up when I'm at the hotel on the road in case the computer catches fire and someone steals one of my hard drives. You know, I'll have them in separate locations. I'm a bit, you know, really, because some of this footage, like I said, you'll, you'll never get it back. And that, I'd say, isn't necessarily as much like me observing the race teams, although it does help to be around that energy because mm -hmm. it, it sort of reinforces it because they're so meticulous and spotless with everything they do. I try to be as well. But no, I think that's just sort of my development as a filmmaker and an editor. Um, nice. and, and, it, and also just, you know, my personality traits as, as, as a person. And sometimes it does border on a little bit of like, all right, I'm, I'm tiring myself out with, with double and triple <laughs> But you know, then then at least then at least you know it's it's all uh, it's all secure. You you mentioned that you you don't get a second take in this in this environment, and you had a bunch of ha nice happy accidents. But I'm sure you looked at this footage and you thought, oh, if I had just thought about capturing this or doing that, you know, it, 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 as filmmakers, we we beat ourselves up a lot about that kind of thing, yeah. and, and and not appreciate what we've done. So I want to know from you. What do you feel like you nailed with this film? What is it that you think really comes across for you? I think, let's see. I mean, all because all the all the camera stuff and the capturing and technical things, like I'm proud of it, but like that's just really just doing it and then yeah, being in the right place and then making sure you're you're capturing it, right? I think what I really uh, am most proud of is probably the voiceover and the insight that I was able to get through. Nice through interview technique uh, process, trying to be thoughtful, getting to know these guys and, and really challenging them to not get away with giving the easy answer. I think that's probably the biggest thing. To me, the unique challenge of driving a racing car is being in that moment and keeping a grip of your mental state. When you've had to fight for that win, if you've somehow given everything of yourself. I feel like I need to have fought for it. I've earned it somehow. I don't understand it, but I think it's arguably what drives me. So what do you love, Adrian, about indie film? What is it that has captured you? What do you appreciate about indie film? You know, I, I like, number one, just doing things myself. I mean, I, 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 I'm fine working with a team, but sometimes I just like to, I, I want to do something and I just want to do it. I want to do it now. I want to do it quick. I want to get it done. I don't want layers of bureaucracy. I don't want people telling me I can't do that. So indie filmmaking and especially like solo indie filmmaking is like <laughs> the, that's the ultimate, right? So just creating, I mean, I've always, I, you know, since I was a kid from an early age, I've always liked to create, whether it started with building blocks and Legos and creating custom structures, drawing, sketching, 
Uh, I was making Jurassic Park knockoffs with my best friend in, in elementary school <laughs> in his backyard. We had like the, you know, the pterodactyl really close to the camera and we were running in the background <laughs> and on like the original iMac, you know, so, so that it's all creativity and creating has always been a part of who I am. And I guess if I ask myself that same question, I asked the drivers in this film, I, I think it comes back to just the, the feelings that I get from it, what it gives to me to be able to share these things with people and see people's reactions and get mm. that energy back that I put out in a way is just incredibly fulfilling and makes me emotional and sustains me and, and it drives me to create. And when I just, you know, that, that moment as a filmmaker, when you just have a really cool scene and the first time you put it in the timeline and kind of just roughly play it out and you mm -hmm. get chills, you know, like that's a great feeling. And then obviously you proceed to watch it about a hundred more times and you're like, whatever, but but you know, it's when you have something special there that, I mean, just all these different feelings um, throughout the process. And, and I enjoy every part of it, you know, um, from, from the beginning to the end. So that, I mean, it just the fulfillment you get, the ability to create, to share this with people. Uh, and the fact that I can, you know, work a non-traditional job, you know, I don't have to go to an office. I can work from home. I travel a lot. You know, it, it's, it's nice. I mean, there's so much to it that I love. To win a motor race is an impossibly difficult task. There's so many factors that you have to consider just to win one race. The performance of the car, the reliability of the car, the ability of the drivers to keep the car on the track, to go forwards, to race, to not have contact, your fuel strategy, your fuel economy, when to make your pit stops, when to do your driver changes, the weather. The more you look at it, you realize that to actually put it all together and get a race win is impossibly difficult. Okay, everything. Did you? Did you get to drive the car? Did you? Did they let you take it for a lap? Almost, almost. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. That, that'll be on the list of things to do. Yeah. You, got, you didn't. You didn't have that much of their trust. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, or, or time. You know, honestly, like, yeah, true. The, the schedules are so tight. You know, the schedules are so tight. Um, but that, that'll be something maybe for the next time. Yeah. And unfortunately awesome. they weren't, they weren't able to bolt in a passenger seat. This car isn't really configured like that. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, they, they, we'll have to figure it out in the future. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was really surprised how small those cars really are. I mean, it's amazing. And be, I know there's a lot of aerodynamics behind that and the idea of it, but that that to me was very interesting how fast they go and how, how much they look bigger than they really are. Yeah, well, this this car in this series, especially the here we go, the Camaro, right? Yeah. Me, um, is actually much closer related to the street component than some of the other GT oh. cars, like like a uh -huh. GTD. So effectively, it's like it's the um, it's the ZL11 LE, like their ultimate track package is basically what this car is built on. But what you do yeah. is you just strip out every single modern amenity and convenience. You know, there's there's no. There's no like cloth or leather seats. There's no any of this. It's just like <laughs> roll bars and safety equipment. And um, you do have some interesting little artifacts left over, like uh, like little AC vents that don't actually work or do anything <laughs> but, on the dash. But but yeah, the, the cars are interesting on the inside. They're just there's bare minimum for performance, right? It's not for aesthetic. Yeah. We're looking at like performance and information displays and racing efficiency. And uh, yeah, I've got to imagine those vents, especially during that race where it was 120 in there, had to be pumping heat the whole time. So that's not always fun. Yeah, yeah. So the car, <laughs> itself, the car actually, like the, they had some issues with the car, which um, didn't actually work its way into the film. I was thinking about including it, didn't quite make the final cut. But in some of those races, like the water uh, hose wasn't working. They have a, mm. a water that goes into their helmet and that they can mm -hmm. drink you know, by pressing a, a button on the steering wheel wasn't working so they had no water throughout these races the car oh is getting God, like man. well over 100 degrees fahrenheit in the car like i said before oh. the metal if you touch the metal it'll burn you um and like us that made these gopros just completely get fried sometimes um luckily oh. they weren't fried when it mattered 